All right, I want to thank the Joint Research and Implant Foundation and Tim for inviting me here to talk on lessons learned uh, with tissue sparing arthroplasty, specifically addressing the arch table. Tim called me to speak on this, told me I had 10 minutes. I reminded him I was from Oklahoma, so I'm not sure if we'll get through all this. But I'll try to talk fast, we'll give it a shot. Next slide. Oops. Disclosures, I don't have any. Uh, but there's my phone number, just kidding. Um, I'm from Oklahoma, so we still ride our horses to work. This was Halloween night. I was doing an open tibia, and I looked up, and the uh, x-ray tech had her costume on. I was like, holy cow. She, at least she didn't have it inflated. So after I got done, the resident was finished in the case. I had her inflate it so I could take a picture. I was okay. It was a grade three open tibia and a smoker and a diabetic. I figured he was going to get infected anyway. She wasn't going <laughs> to hurt anything. So when we speak about tissue sparing arthroplasty, obviously the arc stem is bone conserving. Uh, like Dr. Kagi was talking about immediately before me with a lot more experience, uh, tissue sparing is also important when we're talking about muscles. So with the combination of the arc stem and the direct anterior approach, you do you get the best of both worlds there uh, with bone conserving and muscle conserving. Like I say, this is really what I'm here to talk about is utilizing uh, the arch table um, or, or any type of table with this implant. This is currently the, the table that I use. Uh, here's a picture of it. Um, some advantages of this table, and this isn't a commercial for the table, but you can see it's an attachment to the bed. Uh, it's easy to use. Uh, the mechanics of it are uh, very straightforward. It's easy to train your staff. Um, and it's very portable, and when you're not using it uh, on an anterior hip, it doesn't take up much room, so it's easy to store. Positioning is a little more difficult. I mean, to some extent, it takes some training. Um, so what we're essentially looking for, there's a perineal post that, you, that attaches to your bed. So you want them against the perineal post, you want them 52 inches from their greater trochanter, the ASIS. Basically, you're looking for the center of rotation to your arc. Uh, that way, you'll essentially never be lengthening or shortening them throughout their range of motion, and that's 52 inches. You want their butt parallel to the floor, and so I just pick them up, set them down so they're level, and then make sure their legs are straight. Um, one in the yellow fin leg holder, the other in the arch boot attachment. And that's really important that you take time uh, to do this yourself initially and then take time to train your staff. Because here's what we're looking for, is that perfect interoperative x-ray. And that really affords itself to this. Uh, it's very reproducible. And if you'll just take a little time and set them up before, this is what every interoperative x-ray looks like. It's a lot more dependable than your lateral decubitus where you're leaning the table forward, back, taking another x-ray. This is the way it looks like most every time. The only t thing that I've had trouble with, occasionally I'll have that non-operative leg a little abducted. We pretty much solved that. Uh, mentioned a little more about this. Uh, unlike Dr. Kagi's technique, when you're utilizing uh, the table, this is really important because this is really all you have to go on your leg lengths. Uh, so you need that perfect x-ray because uh, the feel is totally different. Essentially, I say you have to tr trust the approach for the stability and the x-ray for leg lengths. Because they're difficult to shuck. You've got, they're very difficult. To, I mean, you can range them, but you take them out of the boot and contaminate everything. And uh, So I just trust the approach and the uh, uh, x-ray. So talked a lot about incision earlier. I use a pretty much a vertical incision, but as mentioned, it's dealer's choice. Uh, I've been around the country quite a bit trying to uh, start doing this technique. My The way I've developed is just one finger breadth, lateral and distal to the ASIS, trying to stay uh, more lateral away from your lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, and then I just do a hand's breadth, which is about eight to 10 centimeters. 
Uh, it's still proportional to dress size to some degree. Um, and the ASIS is your lighthouse and it can get a little foggy as BMI goes up. So here it is, the heads to the right, uh, feet to the left. Uh, and this is what we're looking for. Uh, the incision's already made in the tensor. You can see the, the abductor gluteus medius there is white. Those are two fairly re reproducible things that make sure you're in the right interval. And usually there are some perforating vessels between those two. The dissection there is um, kind of a subfascial dissection uh, to stay out of that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. At least that's the way I'm doing it. We're gonna have to skip a few steps and go. Um, we, we've addressed some of the exposure of the hip joints. So we're gonna go straight to the, the femoral neck cut. Uh, kind of remember this picture and we've all talked about it. It's a higher cut. Uh, I guess the lesson learned is not too high and not too low. Tim talks about A, B, and C neck cuts. I didn't make it that far in school, so you just kind of look at the uh, osteophyte line. That gives you a pretty good idea. And then with the table, you can pull in CR very easily. Um, and it's usually a more horizontal cut than you think it is. Here's a picture of uh, this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, on that, that's a femoral head just removed. I do it in side two and use a corkscrew to pull it, really hadn't had any difficulty uh, getting it out. But that high neck cut, uh, as mentioned earlier, makes this next step harder. I know it says acetabular reaming, and that's a, a cup in there, but I didn't have a picture of a acetabular reaming, so just imagine that's a reamer. Um, there are some, some ways you can get around the, that neck with this table with traction, you know, internal rotation and trying to drop that neck back. Um, but it can be difficult and you can ding up that neck. Um, one thing that I have done uh, on one case I was struggling with is like Dr. Kagan mentioned earlier, I did my femur first, so then I had all my femoral releases done and the socket was a lot easier. Um, And initially, when I started doing this approach, I did all of my reaming under C-arm. Uh, after about 10 cases, I started just doing my final reaming and cut placement with C-arm. Um, that's one lesson I've learned. Um, the other lesson is, obviously, when you're reaming under C-arm, you know how much medial wall you have, but you have no idea how much anterior and posterior wall you have. So you've got to reach in and feel between each reamer. Uh, you've got to watch that femur level in your forward. You tend to preferentially ream uh, anterior wall away. Uh, but as long as you're aware of those and what's happening, um, then, then you can correct for it. Um, I use offset reamers, but I've done it with straight reamers. I, I like the feel of the straight reamer better, but you kind of beat up that tensor when you, when you use a straight reamer. I've kind of compromised. I do straight reaming initially uh, just to kind of get through that uh, dense subchondral bone and then go to my offsets to, to finish it off. All right, now we're back, acetabular replacement. Um, you know, you do it under x-ray to some extent, but the visual cue uh, to make sure your cup is in the correct position if you haven't done anterior approach, it's, it's kind of strange because your hand is essentially parallel to the floor and against the body. So the tendency is to over anivert uh, and once you get um, uh, your x-ray in there, it'll kind of kind of help you out with that. The big thing about the anterior approach is, is the cup position is so reproducible. Uh, and we saw a paper on that earlier. Even in the big ones, uh, the cups are the same and the x-ray is so good, you know what you're gonna see in the office when it comes in, no surprises there. The mistake generally is too much antiversion. Releases are the key, I'm not gonna talk about those, but uh, here's kind of, uh, of what I go through. The big thing is you've got a posterior hook on your trochanter, you have to get released to get that lateralized in order to let this table work for you where you can fully extend, externally rotate and adduct that leg to make uh, your stem placement easy. So initially, um, we have a starter all to enter your femoral canal, and I don't know, this thing's dangerous. I think you have to have a permit to carry this thing in DC. Uh, uh, but as stated earlier, you don't get aggressive with these. I, 
I put this in by hand or with a real small like foot mallet, uh, and I use x-ray uh, because I, I think as sharp as that is, it'd be fairly easy to go out the go out the back, and the tendency is out the back and medial with this table. Uh, luckily, I haven't learned that lesson yet, um, but I pulled in x-ray and make sure I'm down the pipe. Uh, then, like, uh, it's basically a machining technique, not necessarily a broaching technique. Uh, rat tail rasp on the left is basically working that medial curve. With your broach, you work the medial curve. Uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive the way we're trained because we always work the lateral. Uh, this is working the medial. This is what you don't want. This is too aggressive. Some of you may know this guy. This is Dr. Takach. He was my fellowship trainer. He was supposed to be giving this lecture today, but uh, his son's up for homecoming king tonight, so asked me to step in for him. So this is what we're looking for. You know, that stem following the medial curve. You know, it's real easy to pull in x-ray. Make sure you have what you like. Um, that was, I think, the first one I did. The second one I did, got a little, I think my neck cut's a little high. This is not what I'm looking for. I wasn't happy with the way I followed that medial curve, but you can see similar situation. This lady had a retrograde nail. She had an auto-fused knee, so it was the right surgery for her. She's doing well with this. What we do once we get our trials in, um, take an x-ray of both sides and try to match them up. That gives us an idea if we have any gross mis, uh, mismatch on either side as far as leg length, then we'll adjust that. And then we can take our final x-ray. Um, the final x-ray determines our, our final head length or if we're going to add, attempt to add more offset or anything. There's a lot of value in this concept. I mean, uh, it makes a lot of uh, inherent sense uh, especially combining these two, but it, it does make your socket a little more difficult to do. Um, but if you'll use those tricks and, and like say femur first will help, I, I don't try to do it unless I'm struggling on the socket, but it, but it does help. Thank you.